Well, good morning, everyone. It is awesome to be with you today. Thank you so much for joining us um, on today's broadcast for Surprise Church Bismarck. I am Michelle Witte, and I'm the youth ministry leader at Surprise Church, and I am beyond excited for today's message. So it's pretty awesome to be able to do this if you can't be in church yourself and you're at home or if you're on Facebook or wherever you are. You can listen to the message, you can rewind, you can take notes. And so I encourage you to tell others about this broadcast and to share it on your Facebook page. So without further ado, I just want to uh, let you know that we're starting a brand new series that we actually started last week. And we're gonna do a preview video for you right now so you'll know what this series is all about. We do encourage you to text that number and to ask any question that's on your mind and your heart. Um, remember when maybe you were in school and you wanted to ask a question, but you were too shy, or what if it sounds stupid? There's no dumb questions. Absolutely no dumb questions. And we encourage questions, and we believe that God is all for it. Ask questions. Um, sometimes we've had doubts, I've had doubts, or we're like, why? Why, God? Why do these things happen? So the question that we're going to cover today is why do bad things happen? People have already been texting in these questions. And the number one question has been, why do bad things happen? If God is so loving and kind and caring, why would he allow bad things to happen. Why wouldn't he just snap his finger and say, you know what, wipe it clean. We're not going to have human trafficking. We're not going to have child abuse. We're not going to have wars with Russia and Ukraine. We're not going to have coronavirus. So that's what we're going to dig into today. Um, some people might say, boy, this is going to be a really heavy topic that they chose. But you're going to find a lot of hope from this message. I, I believe that you're going to find a lot of hope. So I'm going to pray. Please join me in prayer. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you for the moisture that you have given us. We didn't know that we wanted it with all this snow, but we prayed for moisture and you're a good God. You gave us the moisture and you gave it to us in the form of snow and a blizzard. So thank you, Lord. I just pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would guide every single word coming out of my mouth. And I pray right now in the name of Jesus that every listener right now, their heart would be penetrated and you would move in them, transform them, change them, that they would hear your word and that they would uh, just receive insight into what you're doing or glimpses of heaven or glimpses of your plan. Um, Lord, I know a lot of people are hurting and there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. So I just pray that all distractions are gone. Every distraction is gone and that we can just take this time together, dig into your word and hear from you in Jesus name. Amen. So we're going to dig in and I've interviewed quite a few people for this message and it's been quite a journey, to say the least. So why do bad things happen? Have you ever noticed how Jesus, you know, he usually flips things on its head? So I'm going to say we could flip this, flip this question on its head. Why do good things happen? Why is there so much good in the world? Why is there so much good in certain people? So I want you to think about these two questions. 
Whether you're a believer or a non-believer, I believe that every person has probably asked this question. Why God? Why? Why did my why was my child born with a hole in his heart? Why did my parents get divorced? Why did you allow Russia and Ukraine to go into war together and all these innocent people to be killed? Why, Lord? Why? Why do young people die? Why did my loved one get cancer? So we're going to dig into it right now. Um, I want to start with saying when we were created, we were given the gift of free will. And we could say that's a gift or maybe it's, in your opinion, it's not a gift. But God didn't want any of us to be robots. It'd be a really quite a, quite a world if God just put us on the planet and we were all robotic and we did exactly what he said and he had the remote control and we were all robots. It would really make no sense. So when Jesus came to earth, he, he gave us some glimpses of miracles and the power of God and some glimpses of heaven and, but he didn't heal everyone. And when Jesus walked the earth, there was turmoil and bad things happening. Again, free will. Free will. Now we could say that still doesn't explain why people would die. A good, good person that dies, that loves the Lord. Why would they die of cancer? Well, I want to dig right into that. I uh, interviewed uh, an amazing woman yesterday. And her name is Lynette. And she spoke with me and we talked about her and her husband who had a wonderful marriage. They didn't always have a wonderful marriage. Back in the 80s, their marriage was pretty rocky and a lot of problems. During that time, Lynette gave her life to the Lord. A few years later, her husband Brian gave his life to the Lord. They loved the Lord. They had a great marriage, great family. Everything's going well. And then he found out he was sick and he had cancer. She said they clung to each other and they just prayed together and they just, uh, they had a firm foundation in the Lord. Well, then Brian started getting better. And she said she admits that they kind of didn't pray as much as before. Uh, things were going good. Things are getting better. Things are getting better. They had prayed for complete healing but they committed whether or not Brian was healed, they would honor God and glorify God no matter what, if Brian was healed or not healed. Well, Brian did die. He did pass away. And Lynette said to me, she was so thankful for Surprise Church that God had placed her in Surprise Church. She was in a community group at the time and through Brian's cancer, her community group and her friends and her family and her church really rallied around them and took great care of them. She told me that after Brian died, the worst thing that anybody could say to someone who was suffering and struggling so much with the loss of a spouse, the worst thing to say is, I know exactly how you feel. She said, by far, that's the worst thing to say. Even if that other person had lost a spouse, she said, they don't know exactly how I feel. She said, the very best thing that people did is they just came and said nothing. They hugged her, didn't say anything. And she said, quite recently, she was having a bad, bad morning. She was at Surprise Church, just kind of really feeling the grief and the pain and the loss and somebody came out to the parking lot, kind of tapped on her window, and they said, I just want to give you a hug. And she said, I needed that hug right at that moment. That's all they did. She said, I just felt the love pouring out of them. They didn't, she didn't need to say the right words or do the right thing. That's all she did. Um, Lynette also said that after her husband had passed away, she had found... She called it a resolution, and it was a long piece of paper. In 2012, her husband had committed to doing certain things in his life, and then he dated it and signed it in 2012, and she had no idea 
he had done that. He never said a word. It was hidden in his drawer. And it was um, things like, I commit to my family. I, I dedicate my life to the Lord. I will honor the Lord, um, the good times, the bad times. And he just had it all written out. And she said it just felt incredible to see that, that he really tried to live his life that way. And now she said to glorify God and to honor her husband who passed away, she's going to take that paper, that resolution, sign her name at the bottom, and commit her life to that. I'm like, wow. The other cool thing I'll say about Lynette is now that she's had that pain and suffering of losing her husband, I believe and I have seen her be an, an incredible witness to others because other people have watched her go through this and how she's responded and reacted. And when I talked to her yesterday, she pointed me to Jesus over and over and over again. Now, she could have ended up bitter, but I believe that Lynette is ending up better. She said she feels stronger in a lot of ways after going through this, which makes no sense. Uh, when you think about the world, you think, well, that doesn't make any sense. She lost her husband. She should, how could she be stronger? But in Jesus and having the firm foundation of Jesus Christ, isn't that cool? We can be more resilient, more compassionate, more loving to other people. And I've seen it firsthand in Lynette's life. Wow. I want to read this scripture to you, and I am actually using this Bible that was given to us as a gift, and it's the Life Recovery Bible. Now, you could say, well, you know, I'm not in recovery of drugs or alcohol. Everybody is in recovery. I'm in recovery of trying to be a control freak. <laughs> um, I'm going to be honest. I realize after 52 years how many times I have tried to control situations tried to control people. And so I'm still in recovery of that. So we're going to go to James and we're going to go to chapter one and we're going to go to verse two all the way to 27. And I just want you to hear these words. And if you have your Bible, get your Bible and find it. Um, I'm really encouraging our youth group to use the Bible. We can use our phones, which is awesome. But I'm telling you what, our students are getting so good at looking up verses, it's getting easier and easier. And you're holding the Bible, looking for the verses, and then you read them out loud. It's powerful. I mean, the phone is powerful too, but it's just cool. So here we go. James chapter 2. Faith and endurance. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, Consider it an opportunity for great joy. Okay, first of all, we're going to say right then, this makes no sense, does it? But let's continue. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. Believers who are poor have something to boast about, for God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls, and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away with all their achievements. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised, promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. 
These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heaven. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. And I love this part, listening and doing. Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and be humbly or and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. For if you listen to the word and don't obey, it is like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself, walk away, and forget what you look like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free... And if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you claim to be religious but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself and your religion is worthless. Pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. This is absolutely so powerful. I, I didn't know which verses to choose for today. And this morning, the Holy Spirit gave me these verses. So again, it's James chapter 1, 2, all the way to 27. I would love and challenge you to read that a few times this week and to really meditate on it. And wow. So we talked about free will, that we all have free will. We are living in a broken world. <laughs> I don't think there's anyone who can dispute that. We are not in heaven. This is a broken world. So as a parent, have you ever allowed certain things to happen to your children? Like... I really love to protect people from getting hurt and I kind of want to soften their blow or stop them, protect them. And sometimes I've done it too much and I actually feel like I've hurt my children or grandchildren when I do that because I need to allow certain things to happen and then they need to figure some things out. They need to fall down, hurt their knee because if I do everything for them and I don't allow them to get hurt, I don't allow them to figure things out. I can be the loving parent and they can come to me and I can guide them. But if I overstep and I'm constantly uh, overprotecting them, never wanting them hurt, I'm really not helping them to grow and mature at all. I've talked to so many people that have had a lot of hard stuff in their lives and they said, not saying that they're super thankful for the hard things that happen, but they just feel the endurance, the resilience, the brand new amazing compassion for others that has grown inside of them when they've gone through bad stuff. Um, I did watch a video with Rick Warren, Rick and Kay Warren. I'm sure you've heard of him. He wrote The Purpose Driven Life, and he's the lead pastor at Saddle back church. Um, their son, Matthew, had committed suicide about 10 years ago. They said they knew for many, many years Matthew either had a mental health illness or depression or something. They went to doctors, they went to psychiatrists, they got meds, they had people praying for Matthew over and over and over. And God did not heal and take away Matthew's depression or mental health illness, whatever it was. And they said it was tough, tough, tough. This lasted for about 20 years. 
and the the tragedy of suicide did happen and they said it was the hardest thing they've ever gone through in their lives can you imagine i know some of you can because you've had a son or daughter commit suicide or a mom or a dad or an uncle i can't even imagine it um but rick and case said when they went to the driveway of their son he had his own place. They didn't have a key. They knew what had happened. They called the police. The police busted down the door. And they said they just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Well, Kay had just written a book called Choose Joy. And she had a necklace on that said Choose Joy. They were sobbing. And Rick looked at her necklace and said, how can we choose joy when this horrific, painful thing happened? He said, oh, so he took 16 weeks off of work. He said he didn't do one staff meeting, one sermon, nothing. He had friends that filled in for him at the church, and he said he was alone with God or alone with his wife. That's it for 16 weeks. And on the other side of that... He said um, the love and the outpouring of love from people was unbelievable. He said if he would not, he and his wife would not have been in a small group, he said I wouldn't even be a pastor right now. He said our small group dropped everything. They came, they hugged us, they cried with us, they brought us food. They didn't really even say the right things because there's nothing to say when your son commits suicide. But he said, um, I mean, they're like walking zombies. And uh, he said, but that, that small community group really helped them. And he said, what really stuck with me is Rick Warren said, your biggest pain or your biggest struggle will be your biggest ministry in your life. And boy, isn't that true? Look at your own life. I, I know that for myself. The biggest pains and struggles that I've had, that is definitely my biggest ministry. And I feel like I have grown leaps and bounds going through hard, hard, hard times where I'm like, Lord, I don't even think I can walk another step. I don't think I can breathe another breath. But it was in those times that I just cried out to Jesus. And I didn't care, honestly, what was going on with the rest of the world. I, that sounds bad. I didn't care what was going on in the news. I didn't care all about all these little things that people were whining and complaining about. I really focused on Jesus and what's important in life. And I grew leaps and bounds. And as hard as it was going through some of these pains and struggles, I wouldn't erase those from my life. That sounds so sick and backwards, but I really wouldn't take them away from from my life story. We each have a story. And um, today I really want to give you hope. I just really want to give you hope. And I really want you to look at your own life. And, and maybe you haven't really had any pains or struggles and you don't, you haven't really suffered. Chances are if you haven't, you're going to. There's going to be some trials coming up. It could be Suffering in your marriage, suffering with your finances, suffering with your kids. Um, I interviewed a sweet, sweet gal who has cancer. And this is her second time now with breast cancer. She was in remission for nine years. And I said, how do you deal with all this? She goes, I just have to take things one day at a time. I have to. She said, I just absolutely have to. Um, I'm going to read this to you. A good, good friend of mine had posted this on Facebook after I asked this question. Why do bad things happen? Does any good come from bad things that happen? She said, I have found that painful circumstances and suffering have brought me closer to the Lord. Even if I don't sense his presence each time in the thick of things, I can always look back later. I can see and trace his hand where he comforted me, supplied a need, or sent help to me. I find it helpful to journal as I look back. Sometimes years later and see how he was with me and how he answered prayers. Suffering and trials have refined my character, made me much more patient, more understanding, and able to be much more selfless. 
Not that I like the process, but I give him praise for his refining in my life through these trials. And this last verse that I read to you, um, when it said, pure and genuine religion in the sight of God the Father means caring for orphans and widows in their distress and refusing to let the world corrupt you. There's evil in the world. The devil is alive. There is evil. And my hope for you today is you'll flip this question around. Why, is, why does God allow bad things? I really want you to look at why is there so much good in people? How can she endure these pain and struggles? I've witnessed her go through this. It's the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. There is hope. There is hope. And that's my prayer for you today. There is hope. You're going to hear many more stories from people and you might have your own story and I hope you'll share it with other people because your biggest pain will be your biggest ministry. Have a wonderful day, a great Sunday. Thank you for joining us.